guys happy 2021 this is the first video i'm making of this year i know that i'm like you know 14 days in already and it's like sarah it's about time like it's been two whole weeks and you haven't posted anything but i thought i would go ahead and make something for you guys today uh, i actually got a, an email from someone named aaron g i'm not gonna say his last name just for his privacy but uh, he asked me a lot of different questions that i actually thought would probably benefit more than just him so i thought i would actually go through through, I sort of paraphrased his email and I thought I'd go through and answer the questions that he sent me. So uh, going to just start out with uh, his first question, which was about humid hides. So his snake, he's a, he doesn't want her to get scale rot and he uh, doesn't want to have to mist everything all the time and um you know also doesn't want mold to grow and stuff like that in the enclosure uh which can happen if you have a particularly if you're in a humid area uh, a lot of people who live like maybe in florida or places like that that are just generally more humid um for the most part you don't even have to mist uh, i know a lot of people are like crazy about okay how much do i have to you know how much humidity does my snake need corn snakes aren't that picky when it comes to humidity corn snakes live everywhere from you know the southern tip of Florida all the way up into Kentucky in some places uh, and Kentucky isn't a super humid area it's it's uh, it's more humid than like where I live which is Indiana uh, because it stays a little warmer a little longer but it's not that much different so as far as the amount of humidity that your snake needs Overall, um, if you have a hygrometer in your enclosure, which I highly recommend you do, uh, the percentage of humidity should probably be anywhere between like 60 to 90, uh, maybe more in the like 60 to 70, 75 range normally, and then maybe somewhere between 80 to 90 uh, if they're going into shed. If you want to keep more of a consistency, you could stick with around the 75 percent and you'll be okay. Um, so as far as the humid hides go though, if you, uh, can't really keep the humidity up into that 75 to 90 percent, then, uh, did I say degrees earlier? I meant percent. If I said degrees at any point, I meant percentage of humidity. Uh, it's early. I've just barely had my coffee that hasn't kicked in yet. So just bear with me. Um, but if you are having trouble keeping that humidity up and you don't want to miss the enclosure, uh, then you want to make a humid hide. And there's a lot of different ways you can do that. Um, one of the ways that I've done it before is actually take uh, an empty, like, gallon ice cream bucket. I look like someone who's eaten a gallon of ice cream. Um, or just a, an empty food container that's big enough for your snake. You can get the, like, plastic sort of one gallon flat, long, uh, they're, you know... Well, they're longer than that, but they're longer than I can show on the screen. So they're probably like 18 inches long by like, I don't know, 8 to 10 inches wide. And then only like 2 or 3 inches tall. Um, some of them are a little bit taller. It's kind of up to you what size you want to get, the 1 gallon or the 2 gallon. Uh, but just, you know, you can cut a hole in the top of that. Put some sphagnum moss in there that's been uh, moistened with warm water. And they'll go in there. Trust me, they'll just go in there by themselves. You won't have to force them in there. Uh, and they will soak in that humidity and it will make them easier for the, make it easier for them to shed. And that's what uh, Aaron has been doing. And he said that he's only been putting it in there for a couple days a week, though. He's not sure if that's enough or too much or what he should do there. And uh, one of the biggest issues that he's having is his snake doesn't really show any signs of shedding before she sheds. And the signs of that are going to be, you know, the cloudy eyes, the sort of dull color to the skin. Uh, if you have um, AML types, especially like snows and blizzards that are white, it's going to be hard to see those signs because... Uh, they're already white, and so if their skin lightens up, it's really hard to tell. Uh, you can't really tell if the skin is light if it's already white. So uh, if you have this issue, I would say uh, you could almost keep a humid hide in there all the time. Uh, what Aaron is worried about a lot is the scale rot. Scale rot is actually not very common. Um, it's more common than some other ailments you're going to see, but uh, I would say it's it's not going to be very common for your snake to get this like fungus uh like in their scales it's going to cause scale rot uh, as long as they have an area that is drier they can move to that area if they are uncomfortable and dry out a little bit so if you constantly have a humid hide in there that's not a bad thing 
And if you decide to only put it in for two days a week and then take it out, that's also fine. Um, I would say at the very least, maybe three days a week. Um, if you want to rotate a humid hide out like that, you can. Uh, like I said, I've had, especially females that are getting ready to lay eggs, I always let them have a humid hide. Uh, from the day that they come out of brumation to the day that they lay their eggs and even for a few weeks after they lay eggs They always have a humid hide constantly because I want them to know that that's where they can go to feel comfortable to lay their eggs I want them to know that that's home so that they will lay their eggs in that and not like in the water bowl or in a corner of their enclosure somewhere uh, so Knowing that I have I keep uh, a humid hide in with my females for, you know, two or three months straight. Uh, and I don't have scale rot issues. I've never had scale rot issues. Now I do live in a drier climate. It doesn't really get naturally humid in Northern Indiana that much, sometimes in the summer, but normally it goes from like a sort of humid spring and then it's like dry the rest of the year for the most part. So um, it's not hard for me to mean, or it's, it's hard for me to maintain humidity, which is why it's better for my snakes to have a humid hide longer periods out of the year, or at the very least, I'll put a humidifier in the snake room. That's usually an easier way for me to do it. But when it comes to the females themselves, I always give them a humid hide. Um, so I don't think uh, that, sorry, that's my phone going off, but I don't think that you're going to have much of an issue with humid hides, keeping them in there for long periods of time. Uh, if you want to keep, you know, let's just say your snake sheds on average once a month. That's pretty, pretty typical. Usually once every month to two months. Uh, so you could, you know, let's say your snake sheds, you don't necessarily need to put a humid hide in there for another four weeks. And then uh, you could just put the humid hide in there until the snake sheds again. Uh, that humid hide might be in there for one week and then it might be in there for four weeks, but that's okay. I don't think that four weeks of just having a humid hide available is actually going to harm your snake. I spent seven minutes talking about this, so I'm going to move on to the next question. Um, he asks the what the danger zone is in terms of belly temperature for the corn snakes. Some people say to keep it below 87, but a lot of places have told him to keep a hot spot at 90. Uh, corn snakes, again, they're not um, they're not super picky. They're relatively easy to take care of. So when it comes to hot spots. If you're going to do hot spots like that, I think it might be better to do more of a basking lamp that is heat only and that you only have on maybe for a couple hours during the day if they want to bask there. Uh, as far as belly heat goes, I definitely recommend keeping it under that 87. I don't see any reason for belly heat to be more than 87 degrees uh, on for like any corn snake, even for the majority of other colubrids. I don't see any reason for like an under tank heater to go over that temperature. Uh, if you did want to get a ceramic basking lamp, uh, it's not going to be a light lamp. It's just going to have heat. You could turn it on for, you know, three or four hours during the day. Uh, maybe in the middle of the day if you can. If not, you know, however long. I wouldn't keep it on all day because it's going to get really hot. But just to give that, give your snake a little extra, like, extra heat for basking time, you can do that. The reason for basking is, you know, they sit in the sun. It helps with vitamin D. Uh, you could even get some sort of heat emitting. I don't, I don't think you could even find a heat emitting uh, a UVB bulb. But if you had a UVB bulb, that would also help for basking a lot like the reasons for basking are not a hundred percent because of the temperature some of it's the vitamin d and some of it of course is the temperature so if you if you want to do a, a basking thing you don't want it to be all the time you just want it to be for a few hours of the day i'm sorry that my phone keeps going off i actually can't uh, turn my phone off right now so you're if it goes off i'm really sorry um that's that's all I have to say, I guess, about basking is they don't have to bask all the time. They don't have to bask all day. Uh, if you want to give them a heat emitting ceramic basking lamp, uh, you could do that. Uh, maybe that along with a standard UVB bulb uh, for the same like amount of time, that would probably really benefit them. But as far as belly heat, there's no reason for that to be over 87 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, the next question is, uh, he would like to switch her over to the microchip, which is a coconut substrate produced by the Reptichip 
makers, uh, and pretty much just asks how often he should replace it and if it's if it's a good thing to use for his snake. And uh, the answer is yeah. I I actually really like coconut substrate a lot. Um, anytime that I use coconut substrate, I either use sandy chips or I will use um, some sort of coconut substrate. Uh, I like to use the coconut substrate most of the time. The sandy chips I find is easier to clean. I don't know for those of you who use sandy chips, I have, I think that they're made of aspen. Um, but I like the sandy chips because I think they're easier to clean. However, I really like the coconut because it does tend to resist mold and I just like the aesthetic of it. That's part of the reason that he also wants to move to this is because he thinks that it looks better, but he's asking me because obviously the health of the animal is more important than the aesthetics of the enclosure. So my answer to whether or not you should get this is sure, if you want to. I don't think you're gonna have much of an issue with mold. Uh, if you do have an issue with it staying too moist for whatever reason, you can actually mix it with sandy chips or with aspen and um, kind of give it a mix. That way you'll have some of that dry, some of that moist, and it will sort of cancel itself out. I've done that before for boa constrictors uh, when their hides either got too humid or not humid enough. Um, I, I feel like the coconut tends to hold moisture a little better. So if you're having issues with keeping your humidity high enough, uh, if you switch to coconut and you know you mist occasionally, the coconut might actually help with like, maintaining the moisture in the enclosure. So that's just something to consider. If you're worried about something being too moist, um, you may not want to do 100% coconut. And it also depends on if you're doing coconut chips or coconut fiber. Coconut fiber is going to retain more moisture than coconut chips will. And I think from what this is, it's kind of a mix, but it's mostly coconut chips. So I think that you'll be fine. Uh, coconut seems to be a really great... Um, a substrate for corn snakes. I haven't had any issue with it, the chips or the fiber. I prefer the fiber personally because again, I live in a climate that isn't like a, a really good humidity uh, most of the time. So the coconut fiber helps maintain that humidity for the snakes. Uh, and how often should you replace it completely? Um, obviously spot cleaning whenever you see something, but I would recommend, you know, once a month or once every two months, if your snake is like younger, it really, it really depends. Um, you know, like for me, it's like cleaning out a litter box, like every day before I go to bed, I want to scoop out you know, what's in the litter box. Uh, and then every week I'll dump it out. Now, corn snakes are not going to poop or pee or whatever uh, as often as cats will. So for me, like me cleaning it every day for a cat is similar to cleaning it every week for the snakes. And so if you are going to you know, completely clean out a cat litter box once a week, once every seven days, then you probably want to clean out your reptiles enclosure completely like once every six to seven weeks. So once a month to once every two months, somewhere in there is probably a, a good amount to, to completely clean out your enclosures. Uh, when I had my boa constrictors in their very large enclosures, I would clean out those uh, once every like six weeks or so um, because, you know, the they were very large, uh, obviously, very large snakes, very large poops. Uh, I would spot clean, but, you know, spot cleaning with that much poop, like, that poop is, like, bigger, at least as big as a human poop. Um, and even though it only happened once every couple weeks to once a month, uh, it was still a lot. So it was worth cleaning it out once every six to eight weeks for them. And I would say it's about the same for corn snakes. That's just my, my thought on it. The next question is actually about Reptilinks. Um, he said he looked at the Reptilinks webpage and he thought about uh, buying some now, but um, because of the amount that he would have to buy in order for them to ship, uh, he thought it might be better to hold off and feed rodents until, he, until she was basically done growing. Uh, essentially, his snake is, is kind of too small for the 8 to 12 gram links right now, uh, but she'll be big enough here pretty soon. So his question actually was, is it okay to continue feeding mice for the next, you know, year maybe until she's big enough to consistently eat the larger lynx? And my answer is absolutely, absolutely yes. Uh, people have been feeding white lab mice to their corn snakes for years. And I mean, even I do 
sometimes. I have some snakes that don't really like the reptilinks that much, or they just are really hesitant to take it, or what have you. So yeah, absolutely. If you want to keep feeding her the white lab mice until she's big enough to get onto some reptilinks, that's fine. There is an unfortunate gap in the sizing of reptilinks. I love reptilinks. I've been trying to feed more of my snakes reptilinks all the time because I think that they are nutritionally a lot more accessible to the snakes. I've talked about this in other videos in the past. Uh, but if if your snake is in that in-between stage where it's too big for one or two or even three micro links and the micro links, I don't even have anything. The micro links are only like that long. Like they're maybe an inch long. And uh, I want to say they're maybe a centimeter in diameter. They're kind of these little cylinders. Um, they, they're great. Maybe they're two centimeters in diameter. It's more like half an inch, I guess, which is about two. It's about two centimeters. So, um, and then the, the micro links are the ones that are about one centimeter in diameter or not. Yeah. In diameter. Sorry. I'm like I said, it's morning. Uh, so if your snake is too small for the larger links, which are the eight to 12 gram links, which are about that big around, not quite as big around as a quarter, I would say. And, um, you know, they're also about, mm, you know, an inch to two inches long, maybe closer to an inch and a half. Um, if your snake is too small for those, but too big for one or two or three of the mini links, then um, I would say definitely go for the rodents until your snake is big enough to hit the eight to 12 gram links. That's just my opinion. And I've, like I said, I've talked before about reptilinks and stuff like that. So I will link that video or maybe I've already linked that video depending on how I'm editing this later. When I say edit it, I just edit it in YouTube. Um, obviously it's kind of long and I don't edit the videos. Most of these are in one take and relatively on the fly. So uh, the last question, which is sort of a question, but sort of not a question is, have I considered doing a YouTube care guide video on corn snakes? And the answer to that is kind of, but also I feel like most of my videos are care guide videos. Um, even this one is kind of a care guide video. I do the Q and A's where people will ask me questions and I'll answer them. Uh, and you know, I, I could do like a very basic video on basic, um, corn snake care. If you guys would like that, uh, leave a comment down below. If you would like that, like, you know, like this video, if that's something that you'd like me to do is make an actual care guide video. I do plan to eventually write a care guide book. It's sort of in the works. Um, there's a lot of things that are going on as far as books right now. I obviously have my first two books out on my website. I'll link that down below. Um, but the first book I'm actually altering right now to make it more user friendly. Um, and I will probably update and correct some of the information. Um, the corrected information is just typos here and there. Uh, I got one person's name wrong. I thought his name was, was Mike and his name was actually Mark. And you know, uh, I'm dyslexic. So those kind of mistakes just happen. And sometimes they're kind of glossed over in the editing phase and not really noticed. And so it's just correcting like minor mistakes like that. Um, but again, if, uh, if you guys would like me to do a video on care guides on a care, just like do a video care guide, I'm happy to do that. Just let me know either by liking or commenting or both. Uh, and, um, also ask any questions that you'd like me to answer. I do plan to do some more morph videos here soon. Um, trying to decide which ones to do next. So if there's a specific morph that you have a question about, uh, let me know that down below as well. If there's a specific one that kind of stands out and a lot of people are curious about that one, uh, I'm happy to do a video on that. So since this is almost 20 minutes long, I'm going to let you guys go. Thank you for watching. I will see you in the next video.